everybody. Uh, so if you're joining in on the YouTube live here, we were having some technical difficulties uh, with our software and I decided to just bring it here so we have people you know within our personal organization that joins in some of these trainings remotely and uh, y'all get to experience that with them tonight. So we're working through some technical difficulties. This is not something I would typically do most of the time. I would post like an edited version of this class later. But in the meantime, uh, this is gonna be the class for tonight. So those who have joined, we're gonna be covering uh, VFD operations. And uh, welcome to APS University training. And uh, we're gonna get rolling here. Uh, how do we look on comments, everything good? Awesome. So I, due to the complications, I, the time I would normally spend kind of doing final prep, I didn't get to, so just uh, be, please be patient with me as we go through this. Anyway, getting the ball rolling here, we are discussing uh, uh, VFD uh, operations as a whole and, and just kind of the full process of what a VFD is, what it's going to do, and it's, it's the theory around it. We'll cover uh, off the agenda here. We're going to go through just the basic electrical theory, cover basic functions, components, the frequency control, the wiring, uh, how the automation ties into that. We'll go into the commissioning side of the system, and if we have time, uh, left in the class, we'll go into some of the troubleshooting side as well. So just uh, hang tight with us here. All right, so electrical theory, basic function. So a, a VFD at its core is it's strictly just a, uh, it's, it's a speed control device. We use it to modulate speed, especially on the commercial side of the industry, and controlling how much you know, a, a motor runs based off of frequency. So, and that's what trips a lot of people up is it, it, it's the frequency, that the, the physical hertz that are getting changed. So instead of running, you know, at 60 hertz here in the U.S., that's the standard measure, measurement of, of electricity uh, for the sine wave, where actually we may be able to run as low as 20 hertz. Um, so those, those, that is what a VFD does. And so, uh, sorry, I'm... What makes that drive operate is, is there's a set of very basic components. We'll get into that. So a VFD, we are inputting, um, you know, most of the time we we'll use 460 volt input power coming in. And that's going to be coming in and hitting a bank of SCRs. Okay, these SCRs are gate drivers and, and they're main function is to, they're, they're rectifying a, uh, the, the sine wave out of the electricity. So normal AC voltage or current has a physical sine wave that is passing through, right? So what we're doing by going through the SCRs, the first step is we're, we're converting this AC out of the AC and into a DC. So we're literally taking part of that sine wave out of the equation. And uh, most of your time, your SCRs are only actually eliminating what's known as a half wave rectification. So to, rec to, to, to fix that, since we're only eliminating half of that sine wave, we actually, from here, we go into a bank of capacitors. So, it, 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 this, the capacitors vary from drive to drive in, in what size and what readings they would be. You know, some of the larger equipment, you know, they could be up to like a 12,000 microfarad capacitor. So, from here we pass into the capacitors and we charge what's that, it's technically a DC voltage even though it's only a half sign. We charge that into the capacitor bank. This capacitor bank will charge and usually will hold around 600 volts of uh, DC power at that point. So we're coming in 460 AC. As we charge through the SCRs, we're going to 
we're going to hold a charge of give or take about 600, maybe 650 inside the capacitor bank. As we come out of that capacitor bank, we will then come into the inverter. Uh, and that inverter is what's going to take and then output a, our, our, our AC voltage again at a set hertz. So it's 60 hertz coming in at this point. DC power doesn't have a hertz because there's no sine wave there to, to measure hertz with, obviously. But whenever we come out, the, the main thing we're trying to control at this point is the hertz value. You will, if you were to put your meter as we're outputting power from the drive, if you were to put your meter on it, you would see the voltage look kind of weird at times. So one, you have to have a true RMS meter in the first place to even get an accurate reading at that point. If you don't, it's going to be sporadic. But uh, at a lower hertz range, you might actually see this AC uh, voltage look lower. And in, in theory, it really is lower, but I don't want that to be confusing and I'm not going to, I don't want to confuse you with this particular piece. We'll focus on just the hertz side of that control function. And so with that, like I said, coming into the drive, we have a AC sine wave coming out of the drive. It's going to be a known as a pulse width modulation. So this pulse width modulation is where we're actually triggering. There's two different gates in here. So let's say it's a three-phase system. It'll have three legs coming off. Each of these legs is going to have a physical gate. And that gate coming off these capacitors, you have positive and negative legs coming in. And those gates will fire back and forth to send a positive negative pulse, positive negative pulse all the way through. And so as that pulse fires, it's, it's simulating a sine wave, even though it's actually a, a, it's, it's, it's a fake sine wave, basically. It's why it's, we, know, we call it pulse width modulation. And it's also the reason why, you know, you can tell a, a motor is on a VFD just based off of the sound of it, okay? So the sound of the motor alone is enough to, you know, once you identify what that is, it has kind of a high pitch uh, frequency to it when it's running, especially at lower speeds. You hear the, the slower the speed, the slower that hertz value, the, the louder that frequency is going to be coming off of that motor. The closer it gets to 60 hertz, the quieter that frequency will get. And that's because of, of the harmonics generated by that pulse width modulation. So that's one of the things to be aware of is it is very different. And there's other things that kind of play into that. Specifically, um, you know, the, the shaft grounding. And I do plan to get into that later into the, into the class. But this is, this is exactly why shaft grounding is imperative that we do nowadays on any kind of drive-driven motor. But that is what this inverter is doing. And that's your full power path going through the drive. As you come in at 460 AC, goes through the SCRs, hits the capacitor bank, the capacitor bank feeds the inverters, and then the inverter will then, uh, through pulse width modulation, output back to the motor. This is a very simplified version. A lot more can tie into this because a lot of times, if you actually, if you ever were to do a teardown on a drive or get into it, you would realize that there'll be a line reactor as well that's helping uh, filter the current going through it. And sometimes those line reactors will actually be on the 460 coming in. And their sole focus is literally like an electric filter. Uh, line reactors, uh, they, it's, it's, just a metal core, kind of like a transformer that's got a coil wrapped around it several times with an in and out and it's, it'll read zero ohms across it and it almost looks like a transformer. Many people mistake them for transformers but it's actually not. It's, it's a line reactor. It does have a scientific term, like a very specific term uh, that I, I don't remember off the top of my head but line reactor is what we call it in the field. 
or a line filter is, is another term I've heard uh, people use. Anyway, this whole purpose going through here is this core is taking any kind of uh, uh, inconsistencies that is being generated within that current field and absorbing it into the core and, and displacing it so that coming in, by the time it comes out, it's a purified current, if that makes sense. And so it, th that core is what allows that to happen. You'll also have devices known as snubbers and uh, there'll be two little tabs up here, and those snubbers job is basically, it's, it's another filter, okay? It's, it's a small capacitor that's mounted to the incoming side of the inverter, and its sole job is just to kind of balance out and, and filter the power coming off of the capacitor bank feeding the inverter assembly. And, and, and th so those are some of the little small nuanced components uh, depending on your drive and setup, there may also be a variety of, of different resistors spread throughout the system that also contribute to your ability to um, uh, uh, control that, that the, the quality of the voltage passing through the drive. One of the biggest killers that drives have, and especially we have in Central Texas, is a... a, a poor power grid. So we have increasingly so here recently, but even prior to a lot of the, the February freeze that we went through, uh, we've always had major power issues in this region for a number of years. And majority of the VFD failures we face are typically because this 460 coming into the drive uh, was, was uh, not a, it was, it was either considerably out of balance, that's one of the major things that we see, or it was having surge pulses come through. So uh, just for whatever reason at the, at the main power distribution as it's coming into the building, you know, those pulses those, uh, or even brownouts, we have all three, including, you know, uh, imbalancing. All of those conditions that happen are very detrimental to this drive's ability to maintain proper electrical flow and operation. And what takes the hit is the SCR and the capacitors. They take the biggest hit and inevitably it ends up wearing them out because they're trying their best through a lot of logic built into the, the VFD to manage its ability to, uh, to feed that clean power source. So just something to be aware of. We'll move on from there. I kind of talked a little bit about the inverter and how we're actually controlling the, f the frequency. And like I said, it's, it's literally just a set of gates that fire back and forth. Uh, there'll be a control module that runs the inverters. Um, and, and that's what is outputting that pulse width modulation. So this would be a, a positive pulse, a negative pulse, a positive and negative. If you were to put this on an oscilloscope that could read it, let's just say this was a si at 60 hertz. Uh, and this was a 60 hertz uh, sine wave as well. Well, a 40 hertz sine wave would look something more like this. It'd be very drawn out. Yeah, very long pulses feeding through. Sorry, I kind of blended in there, but you, you kind of get the idea. It's, it's instead of the, the pulses being closer together at a more rapid pace, they're, they're spread further apart, and so uh, one hertz is literally from one, uh, one crest of the sign to uh, the other side. So that makes one hertz. So if we stretch that out within a, a uh, 60 hertz, a, a second, I believe, or millisecond, something like that. I think it's millisecond anyway. If we stretch that sine wave out, we reduce the hertz being sent. And that's basically what we're doing through the pulse width modulation, is we're stretching the, the hertz pulse and allowing it to run at a, at a lower frequency, which slows that motor down and, can, and helps control that speed. You do have motors out there that are specifically designed to run more than 60 hertz. Uh, chillers are very common for doing this. They have motors, uh, York, for example,
they're 200 hertz motors on some of their screws. And so that, that's the frequency range that those drives are operating within is, is that 200 hertz range. We'll move on. We talked about the power wiring going through. So we will uh, get into some more of the electrical side. So specifically, we will discuss the, uh, uh, the control wiring. And I think for most people, uh, what really, what I see people struggle with is the, uh, the inputs, outputs, and the start, stop, and just kind of how all that works together, how all that makes sense. So a normal drive, is going to have a uh, it'll have a set of inputs and outputs. So we'll draw this across here, and we'll say each one of these is a terminal. It'll be the, the termination numbers will be different between manufacturers, but the principle of how it functions is still the same. Uh, so the, most, the two I'm, I'm, I work with the most are going to be ABB and Danfoss. And so I'll be kind of speaking to, towards what I see from them most frequently. Uh, if there's something outside of that, uh, that's, that's, where, that's the perspective I'm trying to give. Anyway, you start-stop. So basically, start-stop is pretty simple. You're going to have a 24-volt. Uh, a or it may not even be. You're going to have a, a, uh, an output voltage. Actually, no, most of the time they're 24. Usually a 24 volt out, um, out terminal. And typically all it's going to do is it's going to run to an automation panel. And it's just going to go through a, uh, a normally open relay. And what that automation is going to do is it's just going to energize that coil, close the relay, tells the drive, okay, you're getting a start command. Um, I think ABB, it actually is labeled a, a voltage out or, or 24 volts out, and I think it's terminal 12 and 13, uh, which is actually, well, most people call it 12 and 13. I think it's actually like uh, I, I2 and I3. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, anyway, that is your actual input point. And all it's doing is it's just looking for a, uh, a continuity between this, these two points. That's its only function. It's looking, for, it's looking to see continuity pass through here. That's all start stops do. There, it's just, it's, it's a, you, you can send an output out to pass back through and come back to a, a set input and you can program that in and we'll get into more of the commissioning side here shortly but you can program that into the the drive to where it's looking for a set termination point that it wants you to uh, log in at or and I'm sorry not log in it wants you to uh, send power to you can technically use an external power source to send that 24 volts back but it's not recommended uh, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to start crossing the onboard power with external power sources. So you have to be very careful with that. But my understanding is uh, I, we don't practice it, but I think there is a way that they will allow you to send an external 24 volt source back in. And there, is, there will be like a, a, a common or a ground uh, terminal that will allow you to, to do that uh, somewhere on the, on the termination block. From there, you get into, so IO, uh, I, AI and AOs, those are your analog inputs, analog outputs. So your, uh, your analogs are going to typically be your references. And your start-stop is usually considered a binary point, a binary or digital point. 
And if I can't spell, it's because I can't. Um, so your analogs are going to be your references, whether that be speed reference or whether that be a, a feedback reference. And we'll get into those. So usually uh, analog uh, or AI1 is the most common analog input point we use. Depending on your drive and setup, uh, you know, sometimes we may pull in uh, AI2 may already be pre-programmed uh, for the signal we're using. So for example, uh, AI1 may be pre-programmed to use a uh, 0 to 10 volts DC signal for its reference speed. Well, AI2 may be pre-programmed to run a 4 to 20 uh, milliamp signal. So, and all this would just tie back to a, a common, um, and this is coming all from the automation controller. So the automation controller would be, uh, Adam, <laughs> we'll call it BMS. The, the, the building management system would be what feeds this signal. So, uh, like I said, this goes back to specifically what drive manufacturer. You can reprogram these in the drive, and that's all part of what you do during the commissioning process. But essentially, the, what I'm getting at here is, is a drive's basic core function is it is looking for a start-stop signal from, from some source. It doesn't have to be automation. It could be any kind of, of, uh, of relay anything, right? There's a list of items that it could be. But it just wants to see that, that signal coming back. Once it sees that signal, then it says, okay, I can turn on and I can start to operate. And this is what I, you know, I'm looking at this reference signal at that point. Vast majority of your drives out there, at least the ones that we work on in our area, are going to be external reference controlled. They do have the ability to be PID controlled, which is, which is internally. But again, we'll circle back around to that in the commissioning side of this conversation. So that's the point. Tells it to run, start, stop. And then this is your reference telling it to turn on. Now, if you were to have a, uh, an analog output, so AO1, well, this could be a speed reference coming back to the BMS. And so, say the automation is telling the drive at 5 volts DC, it wants it to run, you know, it, that translates into, say, 50% of, of fan speed. Okay, we'll say the fan only actually ramps to 45%. This can be programmed into the, into the graphics and things to where you can actually get a physical representation of you're telling the drive to run 50%, but it's only actually running 45 And And this would be a... A signal point, so for example, it'd be another 0 to 10 volts DC, sending that back, and then the automation has logic in it that knows to convert that, that voltage signal into a speed reference. And so this would be how a analog output and analog input would be used. Uh, this would also be how a binary uh, input is used as well. How are we doing so far? Any questions? Any comments? How many people we got on? Fourteen. Fourteen? Okay. Feedback, reference, yep, we covered that. So let's talk about why, why does the automation tell the drive to run at, at 50%? The vast majority of applications we work with are going to be, you know, air handlers, most of all. Uh, the second most common, I would say, is probably going to be pumps that we're, we're using drives to control speed. 
you, you can use a VFD for nothing more than just a soft starter. Uh, that, that is an option to where you, you don't have any of this. It just strictly has a start stop that you have it programmed so as soon as it gets a start command, it automatically ramps to 100%, you know, 60 hertz operation. We got plenty of them out there that operate that way. That's how some people try to do it. Say so they don't have an automation system that can support uh, running a reference signal for whatever uh, component. We, we have, I've got several pumps I can think of offhand. This, this is exactly what they do. So you don't have to have the reference signal if you commission the drive to not use it. But let's say you did, and let's just use a air handler as an example. So with an air handler, our primary focus is just maintaining uh, static pressure. So if we just want to maintain static pressure, let's say we have one inch of static. This around the around an air handler, you know, we we and we'll get into in a separate class the duct system and the air side of it, but. We've got a bunch of, of terminal units, your VAVs, fan powers, and things out on the floor, and they're controlling how much air uh, is getting to each specific part of the building, part of the zoning control. Well, as those open and close, our static pressure will fluctuate. So if it sees the, um, if it sees the static pressure drop, then it's going to it's going to tell it that okay you know the 50 percent 5 volts DC is not enough I need to step up to 6 volts you know which is going to go to 60 percent to try to uh, maintain to get back to that one inch static point uh, pumps also do this through deferential pressure so in, in, instead of a air handler application we could talk about it from a uh, pumps perspective and on a pump you know it would be focused on, you know, maintain, like I said, maintaining a set uh, deferential. And we know that, you know, between the inlet and outlet uh, on, the, on the, uh, the, typically the main loop, maybe even the, I think some of them will, will run off of the pump itself. Uh, anyway, depending on that deferential, it will, uh, it'll, it'll modulate that speed to maintain a set deferential. So the uh, common one that I've seen anywhere from uh, 7 PSI to 15, 15 PSI of deferential between the supply and return water side of the loop. So, it, yeah, we'll, we'll take it. What's up? Uh, so Travis Reddick asked, if, if the VT has a fault, how am I resetting it to correct rate? Because I usually get a code of 2201. 2201 is a ground fault if memory serves. No, I think, well, 2201, that might be ground fault. I think 2021 is a start stop. That's a, that sounds like ABV. So, that's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, when it comes to resetting it, that's going to be completely dependent upon the specific drive. It's, it's going to be hard to uh, navigate you to that. Usually, you just if, it, if a fault condition exists, especially like a ground fault condition, and we'll get into that a little more later, is you start diving into actually troubleshooting the drive and the motor and, and seeing what's generating that fault. Uh, we will keep moving for now. Yes, Right. So you can, uh, so you can go into um, some of the deeper parameters. It'd be, it'd be more in the more advanced menus. Uh, so I, I highly caution. But the answer is yes. Most of the time, they do give you those parameters to where you can adjust that. But you've got to dive into into those on, kind of on the deeper end. If if Anyone that's not overly familiar with how to commission and set up drives and, you know, the, all the, the variables that they look at, I highly recommend try not to go any deeper than the initial setup menus. So if, if it's something outside of that, uh, you want to be very cautious. 
So majority of the parameters until you get into the advanced side, which is setting up a PID or, or a PID operation is definitely on the advanced side of it. You know, everything outside of that should usually be able to be handled in the, in the uh, assistance menu is how they'll usually term it. It'll be, you know, a, a startup assistant or, or something along those lines. So that, that would definitely be my recommendation there. Um, and it is always good if, if you're dealing with a drive that you're not, you're getting some weird uh, uh, codes on or anything of that nature, go ahead and uh, uh, verify the commissioning on the drive. Go through those assistants, just click on the general startup assistant or something and verify that the motor parameters and everything is set because I've, I've ran into several times in the past where say a motor will get changed and there'll be the, the motor that got put in may have been the wrong motor or may have even been just slightly different. Maybe they had to change it for a specific reason. I don't know. Regardless, the parameters that were set in the drive, because they weren't changed, it was, it was the wrong parameters. They were trying to run something entirely different. So you have to be, you have to be cautious of those types of things as well. Anyway, uh, automation, this is, this is how it's doing it back to the drive. If you don't know, so the volts DC is pretty straightforward. You, you put your meter to volts DC power and you go between the input and the common uh, side of, the, of those terminations on the drive and you'll see a voltage reading. It's, it's pretty straightforward. The 4 to 20 milliamps uh, gets a lot of people in trouble because in that scenario, you have to put your meter in line. So what I mean by that, we'll kind of clear some space here, is if this would normally come up and wire in, you have to take your meter leads and disconnect the wire. And if you've got your, your meter with a turn dial, so coming off the bottom, one wire is going to land here, the other wire is going to land here, and the, the signal is going to pass through your meter and then back into the input. And this is how you can put your meter in line to read, you know, whatever milliamp signal you have. So just, just be aware, if you have to make that measurement, that is how you do it. There are some applications, uh, and I think even they used to, I don't think they take it anymore, but at one point in time, some of the drives, they would come as a 0 to 10 volt. And if you were, say, changing out a drive, you would have to put a resistor in. I think it was a 500 ohm resistor, if I remember right. That's what it is, yeah. So you can convert the, the 4 to 20 milliamp signal to a 2 to 10 signal by installing a resistor between the input and the common. Was that right? I think it's, yeah, yeah, between the input and common side of that, of that signal. And that, that changes this to a uh, 2 to 10 volts DC signal. So that's not been something, most of your new drives don't require that. Let me put it that way. Uh, that is something we've ran into on previous models, and I think most of them have kind of grown beyond that to where you can just, you can fix that into programming. Uh, at one point in time, I think, uh, like you used to have to flip uh, dip switches and things on drives to set the input voltages, whether one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. The, so yeah, the ABB 580 took a lot of that away, where it's not necessary. You can do it in the programming. <clears throat> okay. I think we covered this pretty good detail. Uh, the point of the class isn't to go into every nook and cranny, but what I am trying to do is I am trying to give a full overview of just VFD operation and, and drive parameters, things we need to look for, things we're paying attention to, and just how to utilize what's in front of us, right? And then any questions that come in along the way, we'll try to tackle those as we go.
parameters, motor parameters. So the most common parameters you're going to deal with is the, uh, the horsepower, the, uh, the physical hertz, verifying that it is actually 60. You know, say that this went to, uh, say, Canada, for example. I think they run at 50 hertz, and in European countries, they also run 50 hertz. So here in the U.S., we do 60. Anyway, you can physically change that if you need to. Uh, you set the RPM of the motor, and all of this is on the data tag of the motor. This needs to reflect the, the motor's data tag specifically. Um, the, the actual volts. One of the cautions I'm going to give here is you want to set the volts to what it actually says on the, on the data plate because, you know, it, the motor may say 460 or it could actually say 480. And you have to be cautious as to which. Uh, the drives will come pre-programmed to a set general value. And if it's a 460 volt motor and it says 460 on the tag, don't, just because it says 480 in the drive commissioning doesn't mean leave it at 480. You want to drop that to 460 so that that drive knows how to tailor specifically to that motor. Otherwise, it, the, the, the output voltages and frequencies aren't going to be just quite right for what that motor is designed for. And you're going to dig into, one, its efficiency, two, its lifespan. You're going to wear it out a lot faster. You're also needing the amps. Uh, horsepower, hertz, RPM, volts, amps, uh, the uh, power factor, PF, uh, that, this one, so most of the time you'll never have to mess with this, but there are certain applications and brands that, uh, especially on older drives, this is a very important number because that drive is we're not going to react well and control the motor like it's supposed to if it doesn't have the power factor uh, properly calculated in. And that it'll be like a, they're usually like a 1.9 or a 0.9, something like that. I'm trying to remember now. Um, it's not very often you have to deal with that. I, just, I do want to mention it here that that is an actual thing though, just in case you weren't aware. So these are the main parameters you're going to be looking at. So it could be, say, a 30 horse at 60 hertz. That's a 1775 RPM at 460 volts with 34 amps and a power factor of 1.93. All right. If that's just what you're inputting into the drive. And this can all be done through the commissioning or the assistance menus. So you definitely want to go and utilize those menus and step through this. Another common thing that kind of confuses people is motors have different types of physical designs of the stators. And the vast majority of your heavy commercial applications specifically are going to be asynchronous motors. So there, there are other parameters in there. I'm not going to take the time to go in to break each one of those down. But usually that asynchronous motor is, is going to be your commissioning value. You just, it's as far as you need to go with it right now. This is strictly motor parameters. Next we get into actual control parameters. So most of your drives are going to have the ramp and decel, deceleration, set to... 30 and 30. This would be seconds. Okay? That is way too fast. So it's not that you'll never need that, but what that's going to do to you is that's going to make the automation tech not like who you as an individual very much. Because this is literally how fast the motor is going to ramp and respond to the speed reference signal. I'll go ahead and say that I personally, on 98% of my setups, I will do 90 seconds on the ramp and 60 seconds on the decel. And so, basically, the, way, the sequence of operation there is you lose start-stop signal. As soon as you lose start-stop, 
the motor's not or the drive's not going to immediately just turn off. Okay, it's going to ramp that motor down, and then once it reaches a stop, then it will turn off. Or let's say that the automation for some reason you know, gives it a a signal to um, go from a hundred percent to twenty percent immediately. Right? For, say it happens. That's not going to let that drive just nose dive like that, because it's, it, what it'll do is it'll take that and it'll take it. It'll allow it ninety seconds to slowly ramp that down and come to that speed. That does a couple of things. One, it, it protects your motor better because the drive is not so knee-jerk reaction. But two, it makes it easier for the automation system to balance. So what I've, what I've seen is I've walked into buildings that the, uh, the drive, you can hear it, is, is, is literally stepping the motor up, stepping it down, stepping it up, stepping it down. And it's just back and forth, like within seconds. You can sit and just listen and hear the motor pick up. And as soon as it gets up to speed, it immediately ramps back down. And then picks back up and then ramps back down. And that is due to one of two reasons. Uh, you know, either the, these ramp times are too short. Um, and I've seen people set them as low as, I think, 15 seconds. Which, why you would ever do that, I don't know why. But I, I've, I've, I've seen that. Oh, you've seen zero seconds? Oh, <laughs> that's even better. Zero? If you tune your fit properly, zero is what I want. On a ramp? Yeah. Because I want my fit to show how fast that drive is up and down. Mm -hmm. I don't want anything to affect the pit. I give you that. I give you that. No, that's, that's a good point. So that's, that is a buffer to me. Gotcha. So we have one of our senior automation specialists sitting over here and. Uh, he's, he's a great resource. Why you constantly see me look over at him? Anyway, um, so yeah, so he's saying that they, he's, they've actually intentionally set him up for zero, but we'll we'll get into why that is. We haven't got to the the PID section yet, or even what a PID is. Anyway, so like I said, this is the drive's reactiveness. So. In those scenarios, the, the main issue was usually the automation. So the automation has a, has a reaction time built into the, the logic of the controls to where it knows that it's going to, to increase the speed uh, reference signal or decrease it based off of how far from set point it gets. And so the further from set point it gets, the faster it's going to want to ramp or, or the faster it's going to want to send that signal back out in order to get back to set point. Because as far as the automation is concerned, its only job and function and goal in life is just to satisfy set points. And it's going to tell its components that it's tied to to run in whatever way necessary to meet that demand. So. If the automation logic is set to be too reactive and it's modulating that output up and down too quickly and then you have a really fast drive ramp, so let's say that was on a, on a static uh, PID, a static control, I mean it may sit there and the drive may bounce between 0.8 and 0.12 static just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth and it, its goal is one inch. One inch is what it wants, but because the drive is too reactive because the ramp time is set too low, and then the automation itself is too responsive, uh, it's going to make this happen. And that destroys a motor's ability to one, be efficient, and two, just survive. Because you're, you're just, every time you tell it to ramp up after you told it to, to slow down, it's just another punch right in its face. So those are things you have to pay attention to. 9060 is my recommendation. If you have a building, especially if they have an automation system uh, that is set to responsive, and the automation companies say they have trouble getting it balanced properly, you can always ramp that up even higher. I've ran that as high as 180 seconds for ramp, uh, just so that 
you know, it, it compensates for the automation's overreactiveness. So the drive will still kind of bounce a little bit, but it won't bounce near as bad because you're, you're forcing the drive to react more slowly. So those are little kind of tricks we can do in the commissioning side of the, of the drive to, you know, overcome external parameters. Anyway, this has to be set. It's usually, they'll come fr factory set at 30 seconds. You, you want to adjust that for whatever you're dealing with. I know some people do run a 60 and 30 second on the D-cell. I think that's better than 30-30. Uh, personally, but if you have the, the ability to, you definitely want to do this. Uh, you want to run that 9060. Um, an ID run. I just want to explain what an ID run is. A lot of new drives coming out today is that's it's a very it's a common feature that we have right now and the ID run is literally it's, it's the drives initial rotation to confirm motor parameters so it's trying to see how that motor is going to respond and operate based off of the parameters that you input and that it thinks everything's okay according to its own onboard logic and if you don't input these parameters properly uh, that ID run is one if it doesn't fail completely you know you'll notice it takes it a while to do its thing most of the time that ID run if it's commissioned properly and in the drive from the motor it's pretty quick as soon as it turns on energizes tries to do a pre-rotation it uh, confirms it, it likes everything it, it just saw and you're done so if you're doing a a drive startup commissioning and you're constantly having trouble getting the ID run to pass you really need to look at the motor side of the system um, we uh, ha had a scenario at one point they were having trouble getting that to go through and it ended up being they were trying to get to commission the drive with the disconnect still off and they were just going through and they didn't want to turn the disconnect on at the drive until after they had the VFD set up and on older VFDs, before they started implementing that, uh, you could pre-run the, the VFD and, and have it ramp up without actually doing anything on the motor. So that disconnect being off wasn't a problem. Well, that's no longer the case on a lot of your modern drives. So all that needed to happen was turn that disconnect on, put it through the uh, ID run uh, procedure, it picks everything up and within a matter of seconds it's done. This is pretty straightforward. I just want, not everybody is aware of how that works and, and why that is important. So I wanted to give a quick explanation there. Uh, we will get into a PID. So a PID is a, um, oh shoot, let's see if I can remember now. Proportional integral, integral derivative. There we go. Anyway, in short, what that means in layman's terms is a PID is a control logic function. Its job is to uh, look at a set of input values and based on those input values, it has a, a set of function blocks that tell it based off of you know, time delays and whatever safeties may be involved to then output a output value. Uh, end of the day, it's about as simple as I think I can make that, stretching my own understanding of what PIDs do. Regardless, um, a how am I going to do for that? To kind of show it, a PID. That is what is literally deciding how fast and slow you ramp. So. It, the best way I could explain it is, let's say we're doing a static control and we have a one inch uh, static set point, SP set point, and what, the way it would function is for every 
uh, points for every point one off of set point we go we will increase or decrease so plus slash minus output by one percent based off of a um, a y'all do it in, in kind of funky times for simple simplicity sake for every three seconds off of set point I, if an automation person was watching this right now they'd probably be screaming at me but from a technician perspective and and this this is the basic thought process behind what a PID does is it's got a set point this is what it wants to achieve it's looking at a static pressure input and it knows that for every tenth of, of static off of set point it needs to increase or decrease the output by a set value for so much length of time off of set point I hope that makes sense. So we can do this internally inside the drive. So the automation has it built into it. It has logic blocks and all that good jazz and it can send the signal to the drive. But we have the ability to take a static sensor, a standalone static sensor, and wire that into our VFD. And by doing so, we most of the time those will run off of a standard you know two to ten or a four to twenty milliamp signal or two to ten volts DC and that range that output range will have a specific set 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 of values so let's say we have a two to ten uh, volt DC range two to ten DC and we know that at two volts DC that is supposed to represent uh, 0.5 inches of static and at 10 volts DC uh, that's going to represent two inches of static and that's your your maximum end point across this range and so we would program in the drive that one it's it's a static pressure PID so we're, we're going to maintain static and the analog input the AI is registering a static sensor and based off of the voltage input that's going to tell the drive uh, you know what um, what what static pressure range is operating within and then from there, there there's, there's a lot more to program than just this. Uh, most of the time you end up, at least in my experience, a lot of times we end up going straight from a, a factory guide on how to program this, given our parameters, uh, just to make sure we do it right. But the driver will, will do what the automation does itself. So it'll, it'll just look at that, that sensor and determine static pressure and it'll, it'll based off of how far from, from the set point it is, it'll ramp itself up and down without needing an external logic source to do that. Um, this is, in my opinion, as a, as, a, uh, as a technician, not very easy to do. Um, I've only, personally, I've only done just a handful of them in my career just because it's not, it's not often at all that we, we, have, to, we have to do that. There's, it's just there's not very many buildings and applications that require it. Almost everyone will use some sort of building management system instead. So, in your experience, uh, what is uh, how how often would you say you, you have to program a PID into a drive? Pretty rare. Pretty rare, unless the building still got the mathematics or something like that in it. That makes sense. Uh, or it's like a standalone cooling tower or something random. It's a VAS system, never. Right. You should almost always have a control system doing it if the building has DC controls. Mm -hmm. If the building does not have DC controls, 
Well, and, and yeah, so standalone devices, uh, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I have seen buildings before where the automation that exists is no longer supported. And because it's no longer supported, they, when they went in and have had to repair or redo things in the building, the, uh, the way it was set up in the original system no longer functioned for the new system. And so instead of replacing the building's management system, they set the drives up as external PID control to where the building still sends a start-stop signal because it, it, the, the logic for the building still functions in that way, but the static control no longer works. There's actually, um, uh, I think, a more common example of that would be if the building was originally uh, a pneumatic and DDC hybrid system and the pneumatic portion of it ends up failing and is no longer functional, then you could go in and install a electronic uh, static sensor that would do that for you. And so it, it would replace the pneumatic side of the system that no longer functions. So I, I have had to do that before. Um, so anyway, the point is it exists. Okay, it exists. That's how it. That's the basic uh, theory behind what it's supposed to do. Um, let's take that for what you will. One second. Uh, inputs, outputs, approval covered. Any questions from anybody so far? I've been pretty quiet. How many people we got on? Right. You get way off and shut the fan down or something like that. Derivative is what's going to bring you back in range if you get far out. Uh, and then the guy said something about an investigation to a pump would be an application for a big control system. Hmm. Yeah. Plumbing, so. Right. Yeah. So we're not we're not plumbers. Uh, that, but that, that that that's another example of a standalone uh, example. You know, domestic water, but it's a really good example nonetheless. Uh, inputs, outputs, we've covered that pretty heavily earlier, but we can talk about the various inputs and outputs we have. So uh, again, your AIs are going to be your uh, analog, and, uh, um, inputs, and I promise I made it past the second grade, third grade was kind of iffy. Analog outputs, and your outputs, and then you have your uh, binary inputs, binary outputs. So uh, these are also sometimes referred to as digital. So instead of binary, it would be digital. And all that means is it's just an on or off. So analog is a range between 0 uh, to 100% of any given value, okay? Whatever the value is, your analogs are going to be a range of that value, and it can be anywhere between that range. Your binaries are literally just a on or off. That's it. Nothing else, nothing special. That you get on or off. Pick one. So this would be examples of you know your, your start stop. Uh, you have uh, safety relays. So any kind of safeties uh, would be tied into the binary side of it. Uh, you can program your safeties to either kill start stop or, which at that point would just be wiring them in series with start stop, or they can come in at one of the other. Uh, binary inputs and so say you're using a, a binary input or DI1 uh, for your start stop well DI2 could be your high static safety right so something along those lines uh, you, you'd have the option for. <clears throat>
an example of these are going to be, you know, your, your thermistors, uh, your CTs, your current transducers. Um, CTs could technically, depending on the type, could be either or. Some CTs use the currents to close the switch, and it, it, it's actually a, a, just a binary switch at that point. Or they could be a, uh, an actual reference signal telling the automation system or the drive, whatever, uh, how much current is physically flowing. So uh, CTs fit in both categories. Uh, your references are an example of this. Um, so yeah, that is what it is. So you, you, your speed references coming from the automation, thermistors, and those are going to be your analogs, your binaries. Like I said, they're going to be on, off. They're just switches, your safeties, all of that. You know, if you had a, a, a high static safety, a, a free stat safety on the coil uh, return, if you had a, uh, I mean, hell, honestly, you could go as far as if you had a, a, some kind of drain uh, safety where it wouldn't let it overflow. I mean, just go down the list. There's a variety of, of different things you could do. One of the, uh, oh, one really important safety that trips a lot of people up is the fire shutdown safety. So a lot of drives... Uh, will have an actual dedicated set of, of relays specifically for the fire shutdown side to where uh, they'll come pre-programmed, you just land your, uh, your fire uh, signal on those and as soon as it trips, it's, that drive's locked out. It's going to completely and immediately shut it down. So your, your fire safety is, is one to definitely be aware of. Not all applications are going to have it, uh, but Majority of them are supposed to. I think, and I'm not overly familiar with fire code personally in our area, but uh, I think as it, one or the other has to work. Either the fire shutdown has to work or they have to prove that the automation will respond to the fire shutdown and work or something along those lines. I'm not... Typically, from my standpoint, fire shutdown is Right. We don't ever monitor input. Uh, the brands we support are not UL listed for life safety. Yeah. So some brands like Johnson Controls can be. Um, some of those like ALC, few others can be listed for life safety. We don't do it. Okay. Anything we do will be hardware direct to a VMP or something mechanical to shut the system down. And so that's how it's supposed to be. But the point is, we do run into quite a few that don't have a dedicated fire shutdown. Uh, whether that's... They don't have a dedicated fire shutdown, which you can do is break the safe start stop. Right. Or the safeties, it can all be in line. A lot of times you'll get that where you're, you're high static, your free stat, your fire shutdown, and your start stop are all in a, in a series. Mm -hmm. And any one of those breaks, the fan shuts down. So, same thing. Right. I agree, and that's probably, without digging back through them, that's probably most of the time when we don't see a dedicated fire shutdown. Uh, usually, if the drive has that and they're doing it through the start-stop, uh, there'll be a, a jumper across that in the drive. And so, you, uh, and usually I think they'll even come from the factory, maybe with that jumper pre-installed, maybe on some of the newer ones, I'm trying to remember now. Anyway. Uh, so just something to be aware of, that, that fire safety that, that gets people in trouble. Let's go into, so we got about 30 minutes left. Um, let's go into the, uh, the troubleshooting side of the system. Uh, so there's, there's a, a variety of different uh, safeties that can trip in terms of you know your your VFDs obviously if you have um, you know you can have under 
or over volt. And that's typically going to be on the input side of the system. It's just, yeah, and again, it is a surge or a brownout scenario is going to generate something like that. So just, again, just something to be aware of. There's not a whole lot you can do about this end of the day. And it just, it is what it is. If you get that alarm, uh, most of the time, they'll, it will be a automatic, like a, an auto reset to where it'll trigger. But then once the, uh, the under over voltage subsides, um, it'll reset itself and then go back into operation. One of the things to, to note is drives are very sensitive for a couple of reasons. One, their, their purpose is to, they're trying to protect the motor, but more importantly, they're trying to protect themselves more than anything. So the, the, the drive obviously doesn't want to see itself blow up and die. So it's, it's sensitivity and the parameters that it's responding to are heavily influenced because it's trying not to blow up and die. At the same time, it does have motor protections built in. So, you know, it, it's not going to intentionally overvolt the motor. Uh, but at the same time, if it did overvolt or over, over amp the motor, uh, you know, if the motor shorts out, well, that could go back and damage the drive, and the drive knows that. So, again, input uh, over under voltage, uh, also imbalance. Uh, imbalance is another thing we have common around us to where if the, uh, the lowest volt reading and the highest volt reading on the incoming power is too great of a difference, which by NEC standards is 2%, um, that is going to, to trigger an imbalance alarm. Uh, again, that is something we run into where we are. Uh, you could also have an amperage imbalance, which those are the, the NEC standards for those is 10%. So you can have a you can have up to a 10% allowed imbalance for the tolerance for amperage and only 2% on the voltage. So anything outside of that, and I really don't recommend unless you have a very specific application that you need to. I don't recommend trying to operate outside of that. Uh, I wouldn't narrow it down less than that either. You know, that the 2 and 10% is pretty tried and true. Uh, but I, you're definitely risking damage to the equipment by going over that for sure. Um, that's, the, that's the most common input voltage issues. Now, you've got a variety of alarms for, you know, there, there's... Uh, no start stop or um, really that's probably the, the biggest one outside of the, the motor being a problem that gives you issue uh, the reference reference not being there isn't really going to give you a problem uh, it's just not going to ramp up because it doesn't see a reference the so let's dive into earth ground. So say we've got a drive that's going into an earth ground fault. This is going to be one of two things. You're either talking about a, uh, a motor issue or you're talking about a drive issue. My very first step as soon as I see an earth ground fault is I immediately go in and I start to, I, I check the motor uh, um, at the at the drive. So coming into the drive, you have your L1, L2, and L3. This is your input power. Your output is going to be your um, uh, W, U, and V. Uh, these will be your output terminals at the bottom of the drive, or your T1, maybe another term for it, T1, T2, and T3. So right here at the drive, instead of trying to go to the motor and pull the, the, the pecker head apart and check everything in there, I start here for me. And the very first thing I do is I take my regular meter and I just check ohms uh, winding to winding. So being three phase, we want to see all three windings basically identical. 
Um, and then if that checks okay, I'll check winding to ground. And, uh, and I'll do that, again, that's removing it from the drive terminals, having it hanging free, looking at me. And this is also, after you power down the drive, I need to input a safety disclaimer here, that those capacitors we talked about in the very beginning of the class, uh, they stay charged, and they will not provide mercy. Um, they, they hold that, you know, that 600 volts of, of DC voltage, and most drives take usually about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes to fully discharge. How you know that the drive has completely discharged its voltage is if you take and set your meter to volts DC and read between uh, uh, any of these two, these three terminals, read between T1 and T2, you know, when you first shut the drive down, if it's been running, it may say 500 volts DC. Well, you go back after 10 minutes, and it may say, you know, 10 volts DC, okay, across those terminals. Once that gets down to zero, those capacitors have fully discharged. And you don't want to start doing much of anything at all until they have fully discharged. One, for your own safety, because that will get you. And two, uh, for the safety of the drive, because you don't want to accidentally short something uh, trying to take those apart, and then the problem may not have ever been the drive, but it is now. Anyway, uh, some of the drives, like uh, Yaskawa, actually has an indicator light, uh, a little red light that will illuminate, and as the capacitor bank discharges, the light will dim and dim until it eventually goes out. So just be aware that uh, that exists. Uh, so anyway, after you have discharged, and that'll be your safety disclaimer, let it discharge first. Then you will pull the terminals off. After I check winding to winding, I will use, like I said, we're still at my regular meter, I'll check one leg to ground. Uh, you can check all three legs to ground if you wish. Uh, theoretically, if winding to winding, we're at two ohms across all three windings. All you should need to check is one leg to ground because they're all three still connected. So even if you did see, you know, maybe you saw two volts, I'm sorry, two ohms checking L1 or T1 to ground, you saw two ohms. Well, what that would tell me was T1 or T2 or T3 uh, is the one that's actually shorted. One of those two windings. Uh, if I was to check it and I saw zero, and then I saw T2 and T3, if I did check them was, was two ohms, well again, that's just another indicator, T1 is the one that actually failed, whether it's the wire between the drive and the motor, or whether it's internally in the motor itself. The point is, you don't have to check all three legs if you have proper ohms between the windings. If my regular meter still shows no direct short, say I, I check it in the millions of ohms range and I still get OL. It's something to be careful of is not setting your meters to a set range or if you do, go to the highest range available for your meter. Then I will get my mega out. Now, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, the difference between a, reg a, a mega and a regular voltmeter that has ohms capability is the physical voltage output. So uh, a regular meter is only going to output uh, between maybe 0.5 to maybe 3 or 4 uh, volts of DC power going uh, out of the meter, right? And basically what it's doing is it's looking for the amount of voltage drop going through or coming out of that output. So it knows that if it sees so much drop and it, it has actual flow, uh, it's, it's, it's able to use that to register how many ohms uh, is, is actually allowed, being allowed to, to flow. Ideally, no flow at all means higher resistance. A mega uh, will output uh, for a standard mega we would buy for the field use, either 250 
500 or 1,000 volts of DC voltage coming out of the mega. Now, at that high voltage, you're talking, you know, milliamps worth of uh, actual uh, of, of amperage it's able to handle. So you, you try to put one amp of power on that 1,000 volts, it's going to damage the, the meter. So anyway, the purpose of the mega is not to test winding to winding. The purpose of the mega is to test the insulation of the wires and the stator to a ground source. So if you go from T1 uh, on, your, on your wires, again, we're not checking the drive itself. You don't want to do this on the drive terminals. You're doing this on the motor wiring at the drive. Uh, you're going to go from that, that wire to ground. And I usually test most of mine at 1,000 volts. And uh, you're looking for that resistance value. End of the day, majority of your VFDs, when you drop below about 40 million ohms, uh, your, your winding insulation has gotten too weak uh, and it's not going to let the drive turn that motor on. Now you could say it has a bypass on it. You could put the drive into bypass, which all that means is you don't use the inverter and everything in the drive. You go through a, a dry set of contacts on the side through a starter. Well, you go through that starter, it may run fine. And it may run fine for another, you know, two years. But it's, it's gotten too weak for the drive to operate. And again, this goes back to, these are some of the issues with pulse, pulse width modulation, is it, it has different characteristics uh, than an actual true AC sine wave does. And so that's, that's why the drive isn't able to overcome that uh, like a, a normal, you know, starter would be able to do. Granted, a starter doesn't have that much granule control uh, on, the, on the devices. Regardless, moving on. Um, like I said, ideally, when you make the motor, you want to see that mega ohm value, oh well, at any point given time. My personal mega I use caps out at 2 billion ohms, right? I want to see that motor go to above 2 billion ohms every time without fail. Um, but if I see less than that, then I, I, it's important what that number is. So if it's still at 100,000 ohms, or I'm sorry, 100 million ohms, uh, which would be 1 billion at that point, um, I'm okay. I'm sorry, it wouldn't be 1 billion. If it's at 100 million ohms, I'm okay. And so uh, that drive is probably not tripping on that motor unless the motor runs hot. So the one I have, so my, my everyday meter that I carry is a, what they call a, a Vicky. Um, it's, a, it's actually, <laughs> interestingly, uh, it's, it's one I bought off of Amazon mm, four or five years ago, and it was strictly just an introductory uh, device just to get me going, right? Just, just to have something better than nothing. And I, I don't like and I don't recommend, because uh, when I first got into Megas, I learned on the little LED scale, uh, the little Subco 500s. Um, there's not enough for in-depth analysis. There's not enough information there. It's not. It's not critical enough. Uh, it'll get you by pass-go test, but anyway. So I, I got that as an investment. To be honest, um, you, you can't beat it up like you could a fluke, but it's it's held true and true to this day. Uh, it's, it's definitely a cheap. Mega, and if I ever question it, we have uh, flukes, and we also have a AM probe that the company owns that we can also use in the field if we need to do a deeper analysis. So um, that's what I personally carry, and if I ever don't trust it for any reason, I'll get an AM, the AM probe or the fluke we have in the shop, and uh, we'll, we'll use that instead. Anyway. Um, Say you got the 100,000 
mega ohms to ground through the stator. If the motor is hot when you got that reading, you're probably okay. Because what will happen is the hotter that motor gets, the weaker that, in, that insulation is from shorts to ground. So if you walk up to that motor and the motor is cold to the touch, you, you don't want to immediately take that value at face value. You actually want to turn that motor on and let it run for an hour or two and then check it again. Shut it back down and recheck it because what you'll probably find is you'll put a hand on that motor. The motor's now gotten hot or fairly warm in temperature and you might also find that that 100 million ohms turned into 50 million ohms. Um, you know, and again, the longer it's able to run, the, the lower that value is going to go until the, the drive does trip on ground fault because the, the, the motor is weak. The hotter it gets, the weaker it gets until it gets hot enough to the point the drive can't make it function. But it'll turn on and reset after it's been off overnight or after it's been off for a day or two before you can get there. Um, it'll cool down enough to reset and it'll turn on and run and it'll run perfect without issue for a solid hour you sitting there staring at it but 12 hours from now it won't and that's the test is you don't have to wait the full 12 hours if you don't want to give it two give it three let it physically warm up then shut it down and recheck it at that point uh, if you see that value drop at all that's likely your problem Anyway, say you go through that whole process and everything checks perfect on the motor and it has no issues, then it's very likely going to be within the drive internally. And you can leave the motor terminals disconnected and uh, go to start the drive back up, reset it and try to start it up without the motor load. When you do this, you want to be standing to the side of the motor because they do blow up and they will launch off the wall and you will get in the way of that drive and its path of trajectory. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, you want to stand to the side when you do this test, but if you do that and it trips out on ground fault again, something internally in that drive is failed. And, and drives nowadays are not designed or built to be rebuilt for you know, standard applications. Um, you know, once you get into more of the heavier, the closer to the industrial side and, and there, you actually service drives still in that side of the realm. Majority of your, your, your commercial and heavy commercial applications, those drives are treated like throwaway devices. So that drive fails, the manufacturer really doesn't want to sell you an inverter and a capacitor bank to go in there and rebuild that drive. They're just going to sell you a new drive. And they're going to charge you so much for those parts that it's not worth your time to go in and, and try to rebuild the drive. It's a whole lot cheaper just to buy another drive and put it in. And that's just the, the nature of how the industry has grown. You know, well, back when I first started working with drives, and it was considerably older drives at that point, uh, you know, we did rebuild them. That's just not today's reality. Anyway. Uh, round faults. One of the things I'll bring up now, I'm done on time. I think I got just enough time for it. One of the things we're, we, we are doing now as an industry that very few people are aware of, and you know, we're only more recently on, uh, catching up to speed to is shaft grounding. So if you're not familiar with shaft grounding, it is a very vital piece that everybody needs to understand. Um, it's literally what it sounds like. It's, it's grounding the shaft of the rotor to some other ground source. So what's happening is the, the pulse width modulated uh, uh, voltage of power we're giving to the motors are actually, because of the harmonics of that, uh, that modulation, is creating a, a, a static charge inside of the rotors to where is, the rotors are, are literally electrifying at, at that point. You're, we're not talking like legitimate walk up and shock you. We're talking uh, small uh, currents, but 
what the problem with it is, is it's enough to damage the the uh, the bearings and the races. And but it'll literally what it'll do is enough charge will build on that rotor that it will eventually be able to discharge through the race and through the bearing back to some for some ground source. And when that happens, it pits those bearings and races. And just over time, as it just constantly sits there and just zaps the heck out of the bearing, they wear out. And so motors that at one point in time, you, that motor would go 20 years. Nowadays, we've got motors that, you know, we're struggling to get them to go five years. And we've realized now in the last uh, few years that I'm aware of, at least that it's become more uh, a known information in the industry, is it's because the, the shafts need some sort of grounding. So... Uh, to fix that, you can do that on a, a motor that doesn't have that from the factory by installing a grounding kit and it'll have a ring that sits over, uh, th th that's mounted to the housing and it, most of them will have like a little brass pin with a spring load, uh, a, a brass pin with a spring on it and it'll be kind of curved so that it, it, it meets properly and um, that's all, it's its only function, is it's, it's to take whatever charge gets collected on that rotor and send it back through that, uh, that grounding pin to the motor housing to ground it out so that it never builds that charge to begin with. Uh, a lot of people uh, just haven't, the industry is still catching up to this. Uh, Baldor specifically has a a very good um, article that they've done on this. It's very scientific in my opinion, uh, reading through most of it. The part that actually pertains to us as technicians is basically right there at the very end, the last few pages. Uh, there's a section in there that that's basically kind of spells out what needs to happen and why it's happening in, in more layman type terms than the beginning of the article where they give you the full rundown. Anyway, I highly recommend going and trying to find that article and uh, using it as a, as a reference point. Um, so, anyway, this is, this is something we, we really need to start paying attention to because, you know, what we used to think was just a defect or an install problem or an alignment problem many of these problems that, that a lot of people have struggled with over the last number of years uh, with motors since drives have now started to get installed comes back to that, that charge getting built up on that rotor. And so um, they do come and from the factory with a brush kit. You can, you can specifically purchase that. So uh, the way I do it is if I've got a motor I need to change and it has a VFD that drives it, um, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to put a, a, uh, a, a brush, I'm going to buy a motor that has a brush kit pre-installed. And usually on the pecker head somewhere in there it'll have a, a physical plate or a stamp or a sticker or something that'll indicate to you that that brush kit was pre-installed by the factory. It is built internally to where you can't see it. Um, but it's it's important. So uh, anyway, it just, it's just something to be aware of. We really need to uh, do better at uh, trying to fix that as we go. And so for anybody that's not aware of that being a real thing, you heard it here. It's 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 a thing. So if you're having motors that are having a lot of bearing issues, or you know they're just not getting the lifespan they used to. You want to look into that. Anyway, uh, any final questions uh, on drives? There's there's a lot to be talked about, but these were the uh, uh, the major things we we really deal with. I could go into the physical troubleshooting of the components, whether that be you know how to troubleshoot the SCRs, the capacitors, the inverters.
but it's so rare that people do that until you get into the, the much bigger side, like the, the chillers, for example, or um, you know, you start getting into that more industrial market. That's about the only time you really need to know that information. So we can go into it, but I don't, I don't think we really need to right now. Do we have anything on the, everybody good? Cool. Uh, well, that wraps up this training. Um, hope everybody enjoyed it. Again, anybody that uh, was having any of our technical difficulties, I apologize now. Uh, we will be working on getting those resolved. Uh, we will not be doing lives like this going forward. This was kind of just a, a one-time thing. Uh, but for those who um, are just my subscribers online, I hope you enjoyed it. Kind of a unique experience as to some of the things that, uh, that we try to do. And, and just this is one of the ways we're trying to contribute back to the trade and, and just help make people better. Anyway, I'm going to close it out. I'm going to go home and uh, y'all have a good one.